Okay, am I allowed to start? Okay, hi everybody, I'm Matthew, I'm the tech lead for the Matrix and Projects. Um, here to talk to you about the path, both in past and future, of peer-to-peer -peer Matrix. Um, I guess that most people know what Matrix is by now. Anybody not know what Matrix is? There's three people. That is absolutely hilarious and petrifying. Um, very, very quickly, um, I'll try to rattle through basically the normal slides that we have to try to explain what Matrix is. Um, if you haven't seen this QR code, scan it now if you want to try to like, do a live demo that will go catastrophically wrong. Question? Well, that's a good start. <laughs> Well, what about that URL? Matrix.org, tilde Matthew, p2p demo.html. Does that work? Oh, yeah, remove the demo. Yeah, I remember now. I was trying to make it shorter and then forgot to update the thing. Okay, well, remove the dash demo, everybody, and um, go and try um, grabbing some Docker stuff slowly over the next 10 minutes. So, whilst you do that, Matrix. Open network, real-time, communication, decentralized. Use it for chat, VoIP, VR, AR, IoT. The whole point is to be the missing communication layer of the web. Sucks that the web never got real-time communication. You have amazing things like WebRTC for doing all of your VoIP and media, but there's no signaling plane. There's no way to actually set up those communications in a decentralized manner. Matrix tries to be it. Now you can have a bunch of existing silos, matrix sits in the middle, gluing them together using the bridges. If people saw Half Shots bridging talk earlier in the real-time comms room, you can see um, that's a real thing. And the big differentiator is that there's just no single point where your conversations um, gather. It's replicated over all of the servers. There is never a choke point, unless everybody's on the same server, but we'll ignore that. Architecturally, you have your servers, application servers, clients, and we still have these wretched identity servers, which are the bane of our life, which go and map email addresses and phone numbers through to matrix IDs, which we're going to somehow find a way to decentralize um, in the near future, I hope. And then the spec gives you conversation history, group messaging, E2E encryption, VoIP, all sorts of server-side fun and stuff, um, decentralized content repository, unread accounts, account data, etc. The ecosystem is the spec, the clients, the servers, third-party clients contributed from the wider community, third-party bridges, bots, integrations, and other server implementations, and it's growing all the time. Um, Riot X is coming very soon on Android um, out of beta um, as a complete rewrite of the Android app. Um, if you aren't using Riot X already, um, please start playing with it. We'll basically be announcing the path to 1.0 in the big K auditorium talk at 4 p.m. today. And um, that's probably what you want to know about Matrix. In terms of uptake, this is the daily active users um, that we're seeing on the matrix.org server um, over the last couple of years. You can see it started off in 2016, um, pretty miserable, grew relatively well. We had a bunch of problems in the summer of 2018, but since then it's been um, hockey sticking its way up in a way which is quite scary in terms of handling the scalability, um, fun and games on Synapse that results in that. Um, Community-wise, if you literally look for distinct MX IDs, you get 13 and a half million. Um, on the matrix.org, oh no, in fact, across the network that phones home, we see about 5 million messages a day. That if you select count star of rooms on the matrix.org server, it's about 4.5 uh, million chat rooms. We can see about 20,000 um, servers phoning home, so we roughly double that. There's a bunch don't phone home, which gives us 40,000 total. On the matrix.org home server, it's about 35 in a second, and about 3,500 a second messages out. Loads of projects building on Matrix, lots of companies, including some really big, scary ones building on Matrix, lovely ones who we appreciate building on top of Matrix, and also some even bigger, lovely governments building on top of Matrix too. I'm, I'm sure you know that France deployed Matrix across um, the entire um, public sector over the course of the last year and a half. Um, also, um, Germany has announced, uh, um, announced at Christmas that um, the Bundeswehr, the Ministry of Defense, um, has a Matrix trial running. Um, also, there are .gov servers in the US running on Matrix, and the fourth one is possibly, hopefully, the UK. So, that's enough boring stuff about generic Matrix. Can everyone hear me, by the way? <laughs> Good. Thought I should check. Peer-to-peer -peer Matrix. Why? Matrix is great, but obviously today 
uh, we have home servers. And if you want to have full autonomy of your conversations, you have to run your own server, which is great for us a lot because probably at least two-thirds of the room are professional sysadmins. And we're all feeling a bit smug and elitist and thinking, wow, this is amazing, I can run my own server. For everybody else, they're screwed. They have to go and trust somebody else to run the server for them. The whole point was to give autonomy for people to give back control of communication to the users, and yet the users are a bit lost. So that's one massive reason to look at P2P. Separately, we also get some better onboarding, frankly, from a selfish, Riot-style app developer perspective. It's a pain in the ass to have to tell people, hey, which server do you want to connect to? Do you want to use matrix.org or something from modular.im or use something else? And instead, how about you just start off peer-to-peer -peer and just join the big global peer-to-peer -peer network? Really cool would also be internet-less operation. Now, if you're going hiking, if you're in a plane, if you're hypothetically in the Eurostar coming over from London, um, wouldn't it be nice uh, to be able to communicate locally? Also, big deal is metadata, um, because at the moment, metadata pools on your home server. And you can see every message in terms of who sent it and when they sent it, where they sent it from. And as I'm sure we all know, metadata is in many ways more, intelligence, uh, more useful from an intelligence perspective um, than uh, the actual data itself. Also, it lets us run client-side bridges a bit more easily. That would be really nice for protocols not thinking of, I don't know, WhatsApp by name, um, which don't like you bridging in um, uh, from a kind of bridge service provider. If you can run it yourself as a user, if you want to give your WhatsApp credentials to a third-party client like a matrix bridge, no, it's kind of your problem. And then finally, um, honestly, it raises the bar um, for development. Um, so it forces us to do multi-homed accounts. Because if I'm going peer-to-peer -peer and I've got my account running on my phone and on my laptop, I obviously want my same identity to be on two devices. But if each device is a home server, that also gives us um, the ability to port um, accounts between home servers and account migration. It also forces the home servers to get smaller. Duh. It also forces us to do smarter routing algorithms, because if everybody here was running their own home server on their phone right now, the idea of having to do 296 concurrent HTTP hits every time you send a message is going to be nuts. It also forces us to do low bandwidth transport, because you don't want to be chattering away on HTTP all the time, because that's just going to chew your battery and um, bandwidth. The nicest thing, though, and the really, really, really exciting thing about this is that the clients and the bots and the bridges stay absolutely identical. Not a single line of code needed to be changed because we're just swabbing out a home server that runs somewhere in the cloud and putting it on your phone. So very quick flashback to 2015. You can tell we're in 2015 because we've gone 43 aspect ratio. And um, I gave a talk at a conference called Jeanne Entropique in Rennes um, where we announced our end-to-end -end encryption for the very first time. It was pre megom it was OM, and it was a really cool cryptography conference. And as part of announcing OM, I wrote a bunch of slides to try to avoid getting crucified for the fact that we weren't protecting metadata at that point. And it went like this. Matrix is all about creating bridges. You can't bridge without having metadata leaks because the bridge is an unavoidable metadata leak. However, we also expose metadata on home servers. You have the same DAG that builds up on all the different servers for the same room. Can we do better? And we looked at Pond. Who knows Pond? Oh, interestingly few people, about 10 people. Pond was a really cool, really early metadata-resistant messaging app written by Adam Langley, I think, from Google. is the guy who, I think, ran the TLS team at Google at the time. And um, it, basically, it worked like this. You had Tor, you had hidden services in Tor, and you had a messaging client that would route messages via store and forward um, hidden services, as well as doing traffic pattern resistance, so you couldn't see who was talking to who when. The disadvantage is that it took about 15 minutes to send a message because it was deliberately delaying things in order to avoid the traffic patterns being visible. But we did the same uh, thought experiment. So back in 2015, saying, well, Matrix is meant to evolve to support this, and I'm sure it will happen real soon now. Um, could we do something similar? Yeah, put home servers on the client, use hidden services of some kind to store and forward, and incrementally migrate or bridge from classic DAG. So it would look like that. You'd have a home server running on your little gray client, and the client is still sitting there connecting to it, and then it's bouncing off tour. So back to the present day, almost. 2018 came up with this diagram whilst noodling about where Matrix could go in future. Today, you end up with server-server, client, end-to-end -end encryption sitting in the client. 
what if in the future you had a kind of matrix daemon that ran on your kind of operating system as a Unix daemon that would offload your ohm, and um, then you don't have to keep implementing E2E everywhere? Then what would happen if you actually put that guy as a reusable module into your client cross-platform? And perhaps that guy could evolve into a full peer-to-peer -peer home server if you went and put a home server in it, and you could even offload the E2E into it. And hang on a second, why not actually embed that in the client too to the extent that you end up with a client with a home server in it? And the fun thing is that we've actually built this now. It's called Pantolimon. Talk about it later on today. We're also just in the process of looking at rewriting Pantolimon from Python into Rust and using it as an embeddable engine that can go into arbitrary clients. But meanwhile, what's happening over here? Back to the actual present day. We've got three experiments where we've been playing in P2B. The first one isn't actually we. It's done by Timothy. Are you out here anywhere? There he is. Um, who uh, reached out probably, what, nine months ago or something, or a year ago, to say, hey, I'm doing a bachelor's project. Can I do something with peer-to-peer -peer matrix? At which point, I think I basically gave this talk to him very quickly and said, hey, go wild. And he looked at putting matrix over co-app as low bandwidth um, protocol using Yggdrasil as um, the um, overall PCP overlay network. Who knows what Yggdrasil is? OK, about 20% mm, of the room. It's really cool. Um, experimental peer-to-peer end-to-end -peer, um, -end encrypted overlay network basically creates a big spanning tree um, over a set of manually defined peerings. But once the spanning tree is up and running, you can go and route to people end-to-end -end encrypted across this thing. Um, so what he did was to go and take Synapse, originally Dendrite, but Dendrite wasn't working at the time. So he took Synapse and did a proxy that would take HTTP and do co-app over Egdridzil, very similar to the talk that we gave last year of um, co-app proxy, and um, basically has a similar architecture. That's literally a picture of Egdridzil, the spanning tree of life. And it's literally a spanning tree with a root in the middle. And you can do shortcuts once you've discovered nodes in different places. But you go and discover them via DHT. And then you go and navigate the spanning tree to actually have the routing to go and find somebody. So if you're familiar with spanning tree protocol, this is just it for the internet. Um, architecturally, home server sitting locally. Um, our client isn't shown, but you have a client talking to a home server. Goes through the proxy, goes over a transil and out the other side. And... I'm assured, I haven't tried it myself, but I'm hoping this is a real screenshot of it actually working um, of two um, riots on different ports going over um, Yggdrasil. So that was a very, very cool project. And we started to build a little peer-to-peer -peer secret community of different people, like Neil Alexander, who is the maintainer. Are you maintainer, one of the maintainers? Yes. Of Yggdrasil. <laughs> and um, uh, myself, and also Keegan, who wrote Dendrite originally, or one of the guys who wrote Dendrite originally, going and sort of playing uh, in the space. So the next experiment we did um, started in, I think, November or December or so, where we took Dendrite, which many will know as our next generation Golang home server that has been stuck in development hell of various flavors for about two years. And what if you just swapped out its HTTP transport for its Go and libp2p um, uh, uh, equivalent? Who knows what libp2p is? Surprisingly few people. OK, libp2p is the networking layer for IPFS. And it's a separate module. It's pretty cool. It gives you a whole bunch of different um, mechanisms for discovery, different transports, um, different implementations in different languages. Theoretically, it's very, very nice. In practice, it's still a little rough around the edges, but it's enough to play with. And what you can do is to basically say, hey, libp2p, give me a DHT. And you then go and... Um, I've got my 10-minute warning, which means I have to totally change the tempo of this talk. Um, so you go and um, say, let me to be, give me a Kademlia DHT, um, and then I want a connection between some public keys. So everything is identified by their public keys. Um, so first of all, we had to make Dendrite work again which it does now for Federation, at least for the subset we need for this demo. <laughs> but then we needed to make it work a bit more with, say, messages support to actually have scroll back. 
So, Neil, um, so ironically, despite being the maintainer for Igdradzil, Neil Alexander has come along to work on the P2P stuff for now. So, sorry for um, that. But either way, um, we've now got dendrite talking slash messages. You then just swap out one listener for the other listener. And step four is to try to demo this live with everybody in the room. What can possibly go wrong? So, if anybody actually followed... Uh, oh, that had the right QR code uh, um, on it. That's something. I'm going to go and create an ad hoc network right now. It's going to be called Bicephalus, which is the name of this laptop, on channel 11. And don't all try to join it at once, because it'll probably just fall over. In fact, I haven't even been able to create it. That's, oh, no, I have created it. So, Neil, are you able to jump on this? OK, so I'm going to run the, uh, the commands which are on that URL. I'm going to start off a Docker, which is setting up a Postgres um, install um, instance. And then I'm going to send a dendrite running locally on top somewhere. There it is. So this is invisible on the screen. Oh, it's invisible. No. Thank you for telling me. OK, this is what you're meant to be seeing. In fact, let me just mirror quickly. Uh, well, this is going to be very painful. OK, so that was, um, I went and set um, uh, Postgres running in a Docker there. And I've got Dendrite running here. It's found zero rooms. It's advertised zero rooms. But critically, you can see that it has gone and fired up a public key with a node ID on a whole bunch of different listeners, one of which is 169 network on the ad hoc Wi-Fi just created. The reason we're using ad hoc Wi-Fi is that FOSDEM is filtering multicast this year. Otherwise, we'd just be on the multicast um, on the normal FOSDEM network. I've now discovered one other lib peer to peer peer, which is very reassuring. I'm hoping it's nil. Cool. I'm going to then fire up um, a... Uh, oh, it's port 8082. Ah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Don't make eye contact with my desktop. Um, so here I am on a brand new dendrite running locally. I'm going to create an account for myself. Yeah. There, predictable. Right, fine. And here I am. So I'm going to explore. No. OK, so that's what happens if there are no rooms on the network. By creating a room and then going to explore. OK, I shall create a room quickly. And a room, testing, public room. And you can see it's got a beautiful um, host name here, which is the public key on libp2p. And I've gone and created it as such. I think I even remembered to advertise it on the directory. Now, can you see that now? I might not have. If I'm not, I'm an idiot. Let's see. No, I haven't published the room in the directory. So the directory here is publishing it into the libp2p um, DHT so that, in theory, other people on the network can see it. Come on, demo gods. Everybody pray. Found zero rooms. It's advertised a room. It's found a peer, so you should be able to see it now. I'm not seeing it yet. Uh, well, I can see it here. So if I go to my new home server with this amazing name, I can see testing there with one person in it, except I'm already in it. Anybody else want to try? Anybody else actually installed uh, the Docker rig and able to roam onto my network? This is just where I've had Wi-Fi falls to pieces. No, it might be, but I'm really surprised, given I can see you. Well, on the plus side, I can send messages in Dendrite. Isn't that amazing, everyone? <laughs> Perhaps, um, perhaps I can fake it and try to log on to it just locally. Um, so I'll go and um, spin up another riot. Except, uh, no, it's not going to be. It's just going to be talking to my local one. So that's just going to show us the CS API. Restart the Android, you reckon? Five minutes, right? No pressure. <laughs> Okay, it's restarted. Any better? It's found one room. It's advertised one room. It's discovered one other libp 2 peer. How about you restart your dendrite? <laughs> okay, that's right. I see how it is. <laughs> oh, you made a room? Yeah, so you refresh. Oh. I only see one room directory here. So you've managed to connect to the ad hoc. Cool. Yeah. No joy, Neil? I'll 
soon. Ah, we tested this like six times in a row, and obviously. <laughs> we tested it 20 minutes ago. Yeah. <laughs> the weird thing is that it's, I'm seeing it appear OK. OK, I'm going to leave this running in the background and hastily go to another demo, even though I've only got like two minutes left, um, which is the third experiment. So experiment two was this today, going through um, to this um, in future. However, what would be really awesome would be if we actually put Dendrite in the browser and compiled it to WASM, swatched out the HTTP transport in Go for a JavaScript app one, switched out the SQL driver layer for one in JavaScript two, and you put it in a service worker, and you can just intercept the outbound traffic from Riot and say, actually, put it into WASM instead. And that architecturally looks like this. So we've gone and written a SQLite driver um, for Go, um, uh, which talks through to JavaScript. We've written an HTTP driver for Go that um, talks through to JavaScript also. And it looks a bit like this, hopefully. So uh, uh, ironically, this is going to clash with my Dendrite demo. Um, I assume the other one isn't working, right? Annoying. OK, let me get rid of that. And instead, um, kill that off and quickly go to vector web P2P and do yarn run start. And what this is, is Riot Web, which has literally got the architecture um, that we're looking at here. It goes and pulls in Dendrite as a WASM dependency. It goes and links through to the other members here. And in theory, it should be the best demo in the world. However, this one deliberately doesn't work because whilst we got this bit to work and that bit to work, Dendrite is still talking to Postgres rather than SQLite. And it turns out that rewriting Dendrite's entire um, schema to use SQLite rather than Postgres is non-trivial. So at the moment, this has got a placeholder in the middle. And so that's fired up now. And I should be able to go, um, I think, to this guy here. And if the demo gods were at all smiling at me, let me just check what port this is uh, gone. <laughs> then we have a service worker um, here running um, in the background, although it's actually not the one that was just deployed. In fact, this is going horribly wrong. Um, let me try on a totally different IP address. I'm almost out of time here, presumably. Uh, oh, this is looking a bit more promising, perhaps. Lots and lots of stuff in here. God, the demigods are not with me today. So what it should be doing, I wonder if I'm just on the wrong port. No. Is showing a dendrite. Oh, hang on. I, oh, it looks, what port is this on? This is when your demos go, ah, 8083, obviously. <laughs> OK, so here, hopefully, service worker, oh, thank God for that. It's a demo that's working, everybody. So service worker registration, um, so it's gone and registered service worker. It's opened up a DB. It's created a table called ping, which is our fake dendrite, because we don't have a real dendrite. Then it's firing up a lib P2P thing, which is talking through to a WebSocket star rendezvous service. It's then looking for other people on it. And if I went and set this going in another tab on another port, then they, uh, the two nodes will hopefully discover one another over the P2P and even start, there we go, pinging each other via HTTP. Which, so the two dendrites are now sending pings back and forth, and they're even going and updating the ping table in the database in order to have storage. So that's basically where we're at right now. It's not fully working as a full dendrite, but it's pretty close. And um, there we go. The two right-hand things, a dendrite in Go or dendrite in JS, Going forwards, libp2p or Igdradzil or something else? Who knows? Lots of other questions. What's next in general? E3 encryption going on for DMs today. Cross-signing support today. Riot X and a whole bunch of other stuff too. Thank you very much. Okay. Unfortunately, we have no time for questions. Please exit through that door. A lot of people are waiting. And after the dust has settled, please squish into the middle. Thank you.